As we continue to roll along into the new year, you all continue to have Orioles questions, which means I've got answers coming up on another mailbag episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Wednesday, January 4th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're opening up the mailbag once again. Now, I answered your Orioles questions back on Monday's episode, a mailbag Monday to kick off 2023, but I got a lot of questions for the mailbag this week, so Figured, why not? Let's open up the mailbag one more time here on a Wednesday midweek. I'm answering nine more questions, all from you, the listeners, coming up on today's episode. We'll talk about who could have a breakout season for the Orioles, which pitchers will throw the most innings. We got questions about guys like Austin Voth and Mike Elias and Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutschman and some comparisons between the O's and the Astros of a few years ago. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. Before we get there, though, just did want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms. Remember, if you can, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, if you could leave a five-star rating and a review on the Apple Podcasts app, it would really, really help out the pod a lot. We thank you so much for leaving a review if you have. And also, if you listen on Spotify, if you could leave a five-star rating on Spotify as well, really helps out. And then, of course, we're here on YouTube, on the Locked on Orioles. Orioles YouTube channel. Make sure to like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe to the channel as we approach 200 subscribers. Going to do, or I should say, 2,000 subscribers. We're going to do a big giveaway here on the podcast once we get to 2,000. All you have to do is be subscribed to enter. So make sure to do that as well. We continue on with three episodes a week, generally Monday, Wednesday, Friday, here in the off season until we get to spring training. But I'll have all the Orioles news covered right here for you on the Locked on Orioles podcast. But let's jump right into today's episode, because once again, opening up the mailbag, a mailbag Wednesday here on the pod. And our first question comes from Matt via Twitter, who asks, which Orioles do you think are poised for a breakout season in 2023? This is a good question, because you look ahead and we're less than three months away from opening day right now. I mean, March 30th in Boston, it's, it's Orioles Red Sox to open the season. I put down three names in this category, two pitchers and one hitter. Now I'll start with the hitter. I put down Adley Rutschman. Is this the best way to answer the question? Probably not. He already had an amazing rookie season, finishes second AL rookie of the year voting, showing that he's going to be a cornerstone for this Orioles franchise for a long time to come. But the reason why I think he could still have a breakout is because I think he could easily finish top five, top three in AL MVP voting. Next season, I think he's going to get a full, as long as we get a full healthy season out of Rutschman, it is going to be fun to watch. He's going to be playing maybe above JT Romuto levels. On the pitching side, my first look was to Brian Baker. I think he kind of showed that breakout in the last month or so of the season. Was really, you could argue, in September, the Orioles' best reliever trying to keep them in that playoff race after he had had a really roller coaster rookie season up until that point. But he had some amazing outings, kind of finished off by that outing in New York the last weekend of the season when he struck out five of the six batters that he faced going through the middle of the Yankee order. I think he's going to play a a big role for the Orioles this year. I don't think he's going to be like the closer or the main setup man, but I think he's going to be like their most dominant middle reliever, getting some really key outs in the sixth, seventh, and eighth innings. He's got some great, great stuff. I mean, the fastball up to 100, that changeup when he can throw it for a strike is devastating. And I think he's going to work that cutter into more of a slider Uh, That's going to make him really, really effective this year. And then I said Kyle Bradish, and we saw flashes of this late in the year. I mean, we saw it early in the year when he struck out 11 in St. Louis in May, then the two great starts against the Astros later in the year when he came back from the injury. But it wasn't really a full season. He had some big struggles. He also had the injury that kept him on, on the I.L., But in general, he was good at the end, but that wasn't a breakout season yet, you can say. I mean, he was nowhere close to a full season of pitching well. I think we're going to see Kyle Bradish in the rotation from start to finish this year. And I think we're going to see some great things out of him where he's like challenging Grayson Rodriguez for future ace role of at least the in-house Orioles. 
Next question comes from at Balto Racing on Twitter, who asks, how many starting pitchers will reach 130 innings for the Orioles this season? Another good question that kind of goes along with this. And the first one I'll say is Kyle Bradish going right along with that again, unless there's an injury. And again, all these answers are barring injury. If these guys sustain any kind of significant injuries, it makes it harder to get to a number like 130 innings. But as long as they say generally healthy, I would say Kyle Bradish is up there. I think he's going to be in the in the rotation every five days and has the ability to get deep into games. Kyle Gibson is the easy answer. He's going to kind of fill that Jordan Lyles role. Of course, Lyles threw 179 innings. As long as Gibson's healthy, I think he'll have the easiest time getting above 130 as kind of the innings eater, number four, number five starter for the Orioles. And then I'll say Dean Kramer. You know what? Dean Kramer threw 125 and a third innings last year. And that was with him missing the first two months of the season with that oblique injury. So if he doesn't get hurt, I mean, he easily crosses 130 and he was great. I mean, you know, a, a three point something ERA last year, most of the year. Now, Kramer may not pitch as well as he did in 2022, but I still think he's going to pitch well enough to stay in the rotation for the year. And I think he'll easily eclipse 130. But I will say those are the only three guys, Bradish. Kramer and Gibson that I feel good about crossing that threshold. Now, if the Orioles do sign another veteran starting pitcher or maybe trade for a starting pitcher, I would probably put that guy in the 130 category as well. But if they don't, I mean, the next guy you would talk about is Tyler Wells. He threw 103 and two thirds innings last year and sustained two different injuries throughout the season that really limited how much he pitched almost none at all in the second half for the Orioles. So he was definitely, again, on pace to throw over 130 innings, but the Orioles were limiting his innings, you know, weren't letting him throw more than five innings, basically in almost any start that he had, unless he was really, really efficient for Wells. I think it depends on what his role is. I would say right now he's probably slotted in to be the Orioles number five starter, but if the O's add another pitcher or if, you know, Rodriguez and Hall really break out or something happens, or if, you know, Wells continues to struggle with injuries, which he has, It'll be tough for him, but if he does earn a rotation spot, it could matter, you know, if the O's maybe add a starter at the deadline. I could see Wells being the guy that goes to the bullpen to fill that spot. You never know. I would say Tyler Wells kind of teetering right there. If he's a starter, he probably has a good chance. Austin Voth and Spencer Watkins, I think, will be in the bullpen some, get some stars, but just won't have enough chances. And then obviously there's Grayson Rodriguez and D.L. Hall in the conversation. I think Hall will pitch kind of too much between the bullpen and the rotation to get to 130. And I think Rodriguez will be in the rotation. I just think the Orioles are going to have an innings limit on him. He threw, you know, just 75 innings last year before the injury, threw 103 innings in 2021. That's his professional high. I think something around 130 could be Rodriguez's innings limit, which means if anything at all goes wrong next year, he's probably not going to hit that number. So that's why I would only say that, that Kramer, Bradish, and Gibson are probably those three guys. Third question of the day, talking about starting pitching as well, comes from Cam via Twitter, who asks, why is Austin Voth, who had a 3.04 ERA with the Orioles last year, not really in a lot of people's conversations for the rotation next year and not considered a lock for the 2023 Orioles starting rotation. Good question. Here's why. Despite Austin Voth giving the O's some really good innings after coming over from the Nationals, again, you know, 83 innings, a 304 ERA, he was huge for the Orioles after they claimed him off waivers. I think it's pretty easy to say right now that the Orioles have six currently better rotation options than Austin Voth. And if they add another starting pitcher, which I certainly could still see them doing, it's going to be a guy better than Voth. And that would give them seven better options than Austin Voth. It just makes it tough to lock him into the rotation, let alone even give him a rotation spot. Dean Kramer, Kyle Bradish, Grayson Rodriguez, Kyle Gibson, no question, better options. And I would say definitely Tyler Wells, a better option. And even DL Hall, you know, depending on what his role is going to be, is he's definitely a better rotation option than Austin Voth right now. I mean, Voth has the leg up on guys like Spencer Watkins, Bruce Zimmerman, and Mike Bauman at the moment for rotation spots. But other than that, everybody else is ahead of Voth. 
And, you know, the other thing with Voth is, yeah, he had the great year with the O's, but remember, he had a 10 plus ERA with the Nationals before he was DFA'd. He had an ERA well over five in the 2020 and 2021 seasons with the Nats. That's a long track record of not being good. And obviously the Orioles fixed something, you know, changed the shape of his curveball. They added the sweeper, changed the use of his pitches, and it made him much better in Baltimore down the stretch. But that doesn't mean he's a lock for the rotation. You know, rarely did he ever pitch past five innings. He was more of like a four and dive to a five and dive guy, which means, you know, he's not really going through the order a third time. They always just have better options for starters. And I think both stuff would really play well in the pen. Of course, he was pitching out of the bullpen for the last couple of years for the Nationals, not getting great results. But I think with the new sweeper, the different curveball, and that fastball playing up to the mid to upper 90s, I think Voth could be a really, really good weapon in kind of two or three inning stints out of the bullpen. He pitched in that role a little bit when he came over to the Orioles at times last year. I think he can do it again. And because he has that ability and there's just six better options, it's not really a knock on him. It's just he has a concerning track record with the Nats. And yeah, the O's have fixed him, but he can still play out in the bullpen and there's still six better options. So it would take a few injuries, I think, for him to get a rotation spot uh, to start the season in 2023. He's certainly, I think, going to get some starts and, and he'll be a factor. Just in no way is he a lock to start the year in the rotation. We got plenty more questions to get to here on a Mailbag Wednesday episode of the podcast. Coming up next, we will talk about the Orioles' ownership situation a little bit, the Mike Elias job security, and what the Orioles would look like moving forward if they did make the playoffs in 2023. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by BetOnline.net, which is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis here in January. Because listen, it is college football bowl season, and although most of the bowls are over, had a big day on Monday, still have the college football national championship game coming up next Monday. Stetson Bennett and the Georgia Bulldogs against Max Duggan and the TCU Horn Frogs. I mean, what an incredible day of semifinal games back on Saturday should be an amazing final on Monday. You can get all the lines and the odds on those games at bet online. Plus final regular season week, week 18 of the NFL season, a lot of playoff spots and seating on the line. Make sure to get all your wagers in all your lines, all your odds, all the props, everything for the NFL for week 18 and the playoffs at bet online. Plus of course there's college basketball, the NBA and the NHL going on as well. And if you love sports podcasts, I hope you do. If you're listening to this one, you can find those at bet online as well. They are always the fastest and easiest way to get your betting info. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more at bet online where the game starts. So we're back here on a mailbag Wednesday episode of the locked on Orioles podcast, answering your Orioles questions. Again, all of these questions Coming from you, the listener. If you'd like to submit a question for a future mailbag episode, you can email us at lockedonorioles at gmail.com. Tweet at us at lockedonorioles on Twitter. Also, the DMs are open. You can leave a question in the comment section here on the Locked On Orioles YouTube page, or you can leave a question in the review section on Apple Podcasts when you leave a rating, hopefully a five star rating, and a review for the podcast. And again, most likely next Monday for a mailbag Monday or in the coming weeks. We will get to your question. But let's jump back into the mailbag here. And Mako on Twitter has this next question for us. Is there any realistic new owner that you would be excited about for the Orioles? Obviously, this question comes from the fact that a lot of O's fans, including myself, want the Angeloses to sell this team. Between the fact that they've shown they're not willing to spend any money in free agency right now. And then you add on to the fact that the Angelos family is suing each other and a lot of infighting at the moment. It just seems better for the team that they sell. Now, I'm going to start with the fact that short answer, there's not really owners I'd be excited about. It's going to have to be a billionaire. That's what the O's would need to get this team back to where it needs to be. And I'm not going to go on this podcast simping for any billionaires. However, I do want to sell and I would like it to be a pretty rich person. Now, in terms of like sentimental value, it would be cool if Cal Ripken Jr. kind of, you know, spearheaded an ownership group. He probably wouldn't be able to, to just buy the team himself. Actually, he definitely wouldn't be able to. But if he put together a group of some other you know, notable Baltimore or Maryland people that came together and bought the team, that would be cool. But in terms of spending and trying to get you know 
the O's aren't going to get to a Steve Cohen New York Mets level, but to get to a better level of spending where they're at least middle of the pack in Major League Baseball. I mean, Steve Pashotti would not be a bad choice. And, you know, it depends on how much money he wants to put into the Orioles, obviously already the owner of the Ravens, but he is, according to Forbes, the richest man in Maryland right now. He's worth $6.4 billion from Forbes' last estimate that came late in 2022. And I know he puts a lot of money into the Ravens, and it's a very well-run organization, but he would have the money to put into the Orioles as well. Listen, the stadiums are right next to each other. He wouldn't have to change anything much about his life. He's got the money, and he seems to do a good job with the Ravens of, you know, people know his name and know that he's there, but seems to be fairly hands-off in the processes of most things for the Ravens, and that could kind of be the spot he'd be in with the Orioles would be kind of hands off, let Michael Elias and his crew do their thing, but would supply a lot more money for Michael Elias and crew to then spend in free agency and spend on extensions on their young players as well. Could be kind of a perfect fit, but obviously he'd have to be interested in owning two different teams and that financial investment as well. In a perfect world, he sells the Ravens and, and maybe buys the Orioles. But listen, if he can handle both and, and still spend on both and, and make them good products, I'm all for it. Next question comes from Alf on Twitter. Speaking of the front office, he asks, at what point does Mike Elias get judged kind of critically? Or, or another way to ask it, kind of what, what at what point does Mike Elias' job get judged by wins on the field as well? Because to answer this question, first I got to say, I mean, in terms of what the Angelos has brought Mike Elias in to do when they hired him as GM back in November of 2018, He's done a great job of that by this point. He has completely revamped the Orioles farm system. It was in the tank. Now it's across the board top five, and, and many think the number one system in baseball. They had no resources going towards Latin America and bringing in ball players from there. They've done a great job in the international market since Mike Elias took over and in, in, in adding players and are kind of trying to get back to at least equal footing with other teams in baseball. He's brought in a great analytics department, a great player development department. Players are coming to the Orioles and getting better, both in the minors and the majors for the O's, which is a huge, huge step forward from kind of the last group that was in here. So he's done all those great things, but there's also been a lot of losing on the field. 2019, 2021 were awful seasons. Obviously, the O's get the winning record at 83 and 79 this year, but Elias still did sell at the deadline, and it hurt the Orioles a little bit in terms of trying to get into the postseason. Now, this season did buy him some time, and I think the ownership situation could also go a long way in answering this question because if the Angelos are going to keep this team, I don't think anybody has more job security in Major League Baseball than Mike Elias because when Elias came in, clearly the plan was strip it down, cut costs, revamp the minor league system and player development, and then we'll worry about the major leagues later. And that's what he did. They lost a lot of games, but he completely redid that whole system and got it up to, you know, I think a top 10 system plus player development in all of major league baseball. That's what the O's wanted. And that's what they've gotten here in, in, in you know, about four years since Elias took over. But the next step is winning baseball games. But as the Angeloses continue to fight with each other and, and seem to not be very worried about the Orioles. The things that are going to make them happy are Michael Elias cutting costs. So the Angelos don't have to pay much money. They can still make a lot of money because no matter what happens on the field, if you're an MLB owner, you make a lot of money between revenue sharing and TV contracts and the technology payouts and all these different things. It is a very profitable venue. Owning a major league baseball team, no matter what owners want to tell you, you profit every single year and you profit a lot. So as long as Elias is keeping the cost down and he's putting at least a watchable product out there, which the O's, even if they just continue to run the young guys out there, it's going to be a watchable product. I mean, they got a lot of great prospects ready to come to the big leagues, but I don't think the Angelos are that concerned about taking to the next step, spending, going to the playoffs, being a World Series contender with other pieces as well. So if the Angelos don't sell, Elias may never be judged by the fact that you know maybe the O's stick around 80, 90 wins, but never make that next jump to like a World Series contender every year. Now, if the Angelos do sell the team, another group could come in with different plans and maybe they wouldn't like fire Mike Elias right away. I don't think that would happen, but they'd have maybe different standards, different expectations for Elias to take that next step, spend more and make the team better. So he certainly could be judged differently if a new ownership group came in. But I think as long as the Angelos are operating like they are and are owning the team, I don't think much changes for Mike Elias unless like I would say if it was three straight really bad years on the field, 
Like the O's kind of stuck with the current plan, bring in some veterans to patch the holes, stick with the young guys. And I mean, they don't win more than like 70 games for each of the next three years. I think they might start to turn on Elias a little bit, but until that would happen, I don't even think that's going to happen. He's got crazy job security. Next question comes from Mark on Twitter, who asks kind of the flip side. If the Orioles make the 2023 playoffs, are they World Series contenders in 2024? Now, first of all, if the O's were to make the playoffs next year, it would take a couple of things. First, it would mean they get great play from the young guys and not just, you know, Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson continuing what they've done and Grayson Rodriguez and DL Hall showing what they can do in their first full seasons. But it would also take, you know, Jordan Westberg and, and, and Colton Cowser and Joey Ortiz, you know, all coming up and, and being very good players and, and Ryan Mountcastle getting back to what we know he can be. And Cedric Mullins having a great year. Maybe Austin Hayes figures it out because the O's aren't going to add a whole lot from the outside of the sport and, and the bullpen continues to, you know, pitch like it did. And, and Dean Kramer and Kyle Bradish, you know, they're what uh, they showed in, in flashes last year. And they continue to pitch really, really well. That's what it would take for the Orioles to get to the postseason. So if that happens again for another full season, you start to look at a lot of those guys as more consistent pieces than guys who, you know, like Kramer or, or Bradish or whoever it may be, you're, you're worried about could be flashes in the pan or, or could, you know, start to regress. You worry about that less heading into 2024 if they have another great season. Now, they would also probably have to make, I would think, a couple additions at the trade deadline to get into the postseason next year. You would think they'd probably add a starting pitcher and maybe a left-handed bat at the deadline that would, even if they're rentals, that would help propel them into the postseason. So then maybe it shows they're willing to trade some prospects. And then you go into 2024 thinking, all right, they're willing to trade prospects to make the team better. That makes you think more highly of this organization. And maybe they make they swing a bigger trade next offseason with prospects to get, you know, an ace or, or a huge time bat or something like that. But they'd still have to be willing to spend something in free agency for us to, to think they're legitimate World Series contenders in 2024. And I don't see anything pointing to the Orioles doing that, which means it's going to be tough for me to see them as World Series contenders. I'd certainly still see them as playoff contenders in 2024, but World Series means you got to spend. And at least what they're showing me right now, I don't see them spending next offseason much more than they have so far this offseason. We got three more questions, though, to get to here on today's mailbag episode coming up next, talking about Gunner and Adley extensions, talking about you know, how the Orioles compare to how the Astros did their rebuild, and then uh, a little bit of a fun non-Orioles question to finish things off. Back here on a Mailbag Wednesday episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast, taking your listener questions and answering them about the O's here. Three more questions to wrap things up here on this Mailbag episode. And we'll start with our seventh question of the day. It comes from Jay Franks on Twitter who asks, what is your level of confidence in Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutschman getting contract extensions from the Orioles? This is actually a question I've had before on the mailbag and have kind of answered, but there's a little more data to get to this time. So I wanted to kind of update you with, with Jay Frank's question as well. Let's start with Gunnar Henderson. The Orioles could certainly get an extension done with him at some point in the next couple of years if they throw the right amount of money at Gunnar Henderson, especially with how good we think he's going to be. But the reality of the situation is Gunnar Henderson is a Scott Boris client. And Scott Boris is the best agent in the business. And the reason why is he generally doesn't like his clients to take these team-friendly extensions that generally become under market value. He wants his clients to go to free agency. Now, Scott Boris doesn't want, you know, specifically want his clients to sign with other teams. He just wants them to get the most money possible. And for him, if the team that drafted the player seven years, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10 years later, when they're a free agent is willing to give them the most money. Scott Boris is happy to make that deal and have them return. But if another team is willing to spend much more in free agency, that's where that player is going to end up going. So it is really tough to get those in-house early contract extensions done with Scott Boris clients. I would prepare yourself right now to have Gunnar Henderson at least testing free agency, or at the very least, not even talking extension for the next three or four years. If an extension does get done with a Boris client, it generally happens in the players like last two years before free agency, when you kind of have a better view of what that free agent market is going to look like and what the cost would be for a player like Henderson. Now on the Adley side, I think there's a much better chance that he would get extended before he becomes a free agent. 
At this point, I don't see it happening this offseason, but maybe next offseason they visit those talks. You'd have to think it would start at like 10 years, 200 million. I mean, that's less than, than a guy like Julio Rodriguez got. Rutschman, so critical, so good as a catcher, especially so important to this Orioles organization. It would have to start at something like 10 years, 200 million. Now, I know a lot of people got a little excited when Sean Murphy, after, you know, he's, he's a top five catcher in baseball right now, still pretty young, gets traded from the Athletics to the Braves a couple of weeks ago, and the Braves immediately sign him to an extension. And you look at that extension price, six years, 73 million for Sean Murphy. I, I, I couldn't believe that number, to be quite honest with you. I mean, for Sean Murphy to get, you know, 12 to $13 million a year, that's ridiculous. He is worth much more than that and would be on the open market. But the Braves, as they do, continue to lock up young players on these team-friendly extensions. Some may think, oh, that bodes well for Adley Rutschman. You know, Murphy didn't completely obliterate the catching contract market. I honestly think this contract was so low for Sean Murphy that it doesn't even affect the Adley contract. The only positive is that it wasn't super high. So, you know, maybe if it was a super high contract, it would have upped Adley's value. But I don't think it brings down the value of an Adley extension at all because it was just such a, a crazy extension, at least from my viewpoint. So again, something has to start with with 10 years, 200 million. My confidence level for this offseason is almost zero that it'll get done with either guy. It's very low for Gunnar Henderson for the next few years. It's mid-level, my confidence, at least for Adley next offseason. That's, I think, when we'll revisit it. And we will see. I mean, they got to lock him up because he's only going to get more expensive and I want him in an Orioles uniform for 20 years and then retiring as an Oriole. Next question comes from Ben Obi on Twitter, who asks, will Mike Elias and the Orioles work like the Astros did and not trade their prospects until the contention window opens? And this is interesting because, you know, the Orioles have, you could argue, only made one prospect for major league or trade. They made it a couple weeks ago, player to be named later to the Mets for James McCann. But as we know, it's not going to be a very significant prospect going to New York. So they really still haven't made that trade where they're trading from that prospect depth to get impact big leaguers. But the reason why I specifically wanted to address this question, because everybody likes to compare the Orioles and the Astros, of course, Mike Elias and Sigma Dell coming from Houston, the rebuild that basically worked out perfectly. Nobody's done the rebuild better than the Astros did. The O's are trying to, to somewhat replicate that. But the reason why I wanted to bring up this question, because it's technically not correct, the statement that's made in the question that the Astros waited until the contention window was open to trade their prospects. Let's kind of go back in time. The Astros in 2014 went 70 and 92. They then turned things around in 2015. They kind of somewhat came out of nowhere, although people saw it coming a little bit. I mean, they had Carlos Correa and, and George Springer and guys like that coming to the big leagues. They went 86 and 76. They got a wild card and they made the postseason in the American League in 2015. 2016 took a little step back, missed the playoffs. Then they went for it in 2017. And of course, to get a little help from the trash cans, but they did win the World Series and, and they've been really a dynasty in the American League since then. But again, 2014, they took a step up. They were in the 50 to 60 win category for a while. They took a step forward and they go 70 and 92 in 2014. I don't think a 70 and 92 season after a bunch of years of 50 and 60 wins means your contention window has opened yet. I would say it opened after 2015, after they went to the playoffs. But the Astros made some significant trades, giving away prospects for big leaguers between the end of 2014 and the end of that 2015 season when they got to the postseason. November of 2014, again, it's a team coming off a 70 and 92 season. Not a lot of people still were predicting them to make the playoffs that next year, despite the fact that they did have some young talent. They traded two of their top 30 prospects, Nick Tropiano, a pitcher who had come up at the end of the year and made four starts, and then Carlos Perez, a minor league catcher. Tropiano was number 18 in the system, Perez number 25 in the system. Traded the two of them to the Angels for Hank Conger, who was kind of an established big league catcher at that point. Conger comes in, you know, he wasn't like a destroying everybody as a starting catcher, but he was a solid addition to that team to help them out. It was like a bigger James McCann version. Then you fast forward a couple of months to January of 2015, and they kind of make a splash trade. Speaking of catchers, they go out and they get Evan Gaddis along with James Hoyt, a big league reliever from the Atlanta Braves. Gaddis at that point had some good numbers with the Braves, and, and he comes in and, and gets slotted right into the middle of the Astros lineup. But again, 
they gave up three top 20 prospects in that deal. They gave up Mike fulton who had come up at the end of that season for the Astros in 2014 as a rookie. He was their number five prospect. They gave up our old fan Rio Ruiz, who at that point was the number 10 prospect in the Astros system and was seen to be a future big leaguer, which obviously he was with the Orioles, but not exactly what he thought he would be. And then Andrew Thurman, a guy who never really panned out, but at that point was some places, you know, somewhere between 13 and 20 ranked in their system. So they gave up three legitimate prospects, two of which who became big leaguers before that 2015 season to go and get Gaddis and to get James Hoyt. And those two guys helped them in 2015. So I would say they made those two trades before they knew their quote contention window was open. Then you go to the deadline in 2015. Of course, the Astros are playing good baseball. They are 58 and 46 at the deadline. They have a two game lead. They're in first place in the AL West at that point. So certainly you're thinking we can get to the playoffs. We're in first place here as we hit the end of July and they swung two huge trades. Now you could argue, you know, especially to Ben Obi asking the question that the contention window had opened once they saw they could win games early in 2015, but these are pretty big trades for just having a half season of good baseball. The first one came about a week before the deadline as they traded, I wouldn't say two of their biggest prospects, but they traded Daniel Mangden, who was their number 24 prospect, and Jacob Nottingham, who wasn't a top 30 guy, but was a solid catching prospect. Of course, both of those guys have been in the big leagues, traded them both to the athletics, got the veteran lefty Scott Kazmir back to, to share up their rotation. And then a week later on deadline day, they swung a huge deal with the Brewers, they went and got Carlos Gomez as kind of an impact middle of the order bat, and they got Mike Fires to help their starting rotation as well. They gave up four legitimate prospects in that deal, three top 10 prospects. They gave up Domingo Santana, who was their number five prospect. They gave up Brett Phillips, who was their number six prospect, and they gave away Josh Hader, their number seven prospect. All those guys, plus they traded Adrian Hauser who was outside the top 30, but was kind of like an outside looking in guy, like places that ranked him right around 40 in their organization. But of course, Hauser is now an impact starter for the Brewers. Those are four guys who became big leaguers, two of them impact big leaguers, I would say at this point, to go get two legitimate pieces to help that team. So again, you could argue that the window had already opened at that point when they made the move because they had had a good half season, but it's still only a good half season. And that was a Pretty blockbustery trade. I mean, you're trading away three top 10 prospects. Could you see the Orioles trading away Jordan Westberg, Connor Norby, and Heston Kerstad in a package this deadline to go get a starting pitcher? I mean, maybe, but I think that would shock some people. And that's basically what the Astros did. And, and throw in another prospect who you think is good, like a, a bottom of the top 30 pitcher as well to go get a, a pitcher and an outfielder. I think the O's would get better by doing that, but I think it would shock some people. But that's what the Astros did. So I don't know if the Astros really held their prospects as much as people think. They held on to the top couple of guys. They didn't deal away the the Correas or the, the, the Springers of the world. They kept those guys and they came up and were really impact players. But that system was really, really deep. You run through, go, go do yourself a favor. Go look at those Astros top prospect lists from like 2013 through 2016. There's a lot of guys who are big leaguers, like deep on that list in the 40s and 50s, not just big leaguers for the Astros, but guys they traded away and then got to the big leagues with other teams as well. So they traded from that depth pretty early. And I think it's something that if the O's want to emulate the Astros, they could do it right now and set themselves up to have a 2023 like the Astros had in 2015 when they led their division a lot of the year and did get back to the playoffs. It's one way they could certainly operate. And then one final question today, kind of slipping away from the Orioles. Cousin Smith asked this one a while ago for a mailbag and, and got to get it in here, asking via Twitter, kind of getting away from baseball here. Just a little fun question to finish things off. What is your go-to McDonald's order? Now, full disclosure, haven't had McDonald's in a while, but it's kind of three things I would go to. The McChicken, always easy. You know, even late at night, you get like two McChickens. They're what, a dollar each, $2 each. Easy, solid. The snack wraps, when they had them, I know they took them away for a while. I'm not sure if they're back. The snack wraps were good. And then quarter pounder with cheese. You know, if I was going more to mealtime at, at lunch or dinner, quarter pounder with cheese would be the go-to. And the one, I don't know if this is a hot take or not about McDonald's, but not a fan of the McNuggets. Like, keep the McNuggets away from me. You can have as, as many of them as you want. There are some good things on the McDonald's menu. I don't even want to look at the chicken McNuggets. Take them away from me. 
Those are my McDonald's takes. Again, I haven't eaten McDonald's in a couple of years probably, but those are my McDonald's takes. McChicken, number one, that's the go-to at McDonald's. But that'll do it for a Mailbag Wednesday episode of the podcast. Again, thank you so much for asking questions. If you asked a question to the mailbag, it didn't get answered. Again, look for a future mailbag episode. We will get to your question here on the podcast. Got one more episode coming up this week. We'll be back with you on Friday. Unless some news breaks, then we'll be back a little bit earlier. But again, on Friday to wrap up the pod for the week here at Locked on Orioles. Talking maybe some Orioles trade scenarios potentially for the rest of the offseason as well. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked on Orioles podcast part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.